Welcome, Welcome internet. Okay, now okay, I'm now I'm actually... <laughs> Oh god. Yeah, is that Tommy? Yeah, it's me. Hey. All right. Welcome, internet. Uh, Tig Radio number six, I believe. Time is a flying. Mm. Uh, you're probably jamming at your local global game jam or recovering from the jam, I suppose, as the submission date has now passed. And if you are not jamming, welcome. And the show today will be more of a longer discussion. We have with us Mike and Greg. Go ahead and. Hey, Mike and Greg. Hey, Hey, Greg. Who are you guys? Uh, I'm Greg. This is Mike. We're Mike and Greg. Hey, I'm Mike. And this is Greg. (laughs) (laughs) We've been right for a long time. No, we're a couple of guys uh, living in Iowa and we make games. Uh, We started out as Intuition. Um, did like Dino Wars and uh, a bunch of smaller Flash games after that. Effing Hail, Figure Eight, Gray, and uh, yeah. So now we're, I don't know, Mike and Greg or something? Yeah. It's still kind of like a tentative thing. but Yeah, you, you, you guys basically rebranded Intuition into a collective, right? Where you basically... Yeah weren't all working on the same project together, but you were still kind of capitalized, I guess, on the branding yeah, of we, intuition? We we started with four guys, and then we added another one. So we were five people at our height, and we still didn't know how to make money doing anything. So, like, five guys just was really super heavyweight for us and, and Flash games in general as far as how we knew to make money doing it. So we kind of decided to split up a little bit but keep the branding so that we could collaborate if we wanted to and kind of build a brand together. But not have to feed everybody else all the time. So, so when you guys so when you pitch a game to like um you know like Flash Game License or some other portal directly, do you actually present it as like an Intuition Collective game? Like, how does yeah. that actually rubber meet the road? Um. Yeah. I mean, uh, anyone who's in the collective just puts it on a like puts the Intuition logo on there, and we use all our powers, as meager as they might be, to uh, try and get. Everyone as much money as possible. Um, so, like, it's pretty open. It's pretty, uh, I don't know, bohemian in a way. So, um, the more the more the merrier, I suppose. So, like, I'm we have about. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say we have kind of like uh, I've collaborated with uh, like Jacob Grant and Andy Moore and uh, uh, Tyler. Most recently, Tyler Cavale. So, like, we kind of bring them in and, you know, we put the intuition thing on there if it helps us. If it doesn't, you know, like in the case of, say, for Tyler, you know, we didn't really need to do any, like, promotion for our latest game, Tetraform. But, um, yeah, so we're, we bring in people all the time. Well, and that's actually what I wanted to ask was with the games that have been branded intuition thus far, what has the makeup of the teams been? Like, who has done what? Okay, um, so Dino Wars was Mike, myself, um, Joe Bergeron, Josh Larson, Ted Martins. Um, okay. So those, that was all five of us. And I did Effing Hail with uh, Jacob. Um, There's a long, it seems like a long list. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know, Great Red Herring Chase with him, too. And then Mike and I did Wild and Free, Gray, Figure Eight. We were doing Life Raft, but we quit that. And, uh, and Eon, which isn't Eon. out yet. It'll be yeah. out pretty soon. And, cool. Uh, Josh has done, he's actually doing a Mega Bank Executive Humiliation Challenge. It's like a mm-hmm. kind of a launch thing. It's really cool. It's like a in Unity, and he's trying to figure out a way to to make that work, um, shopping around for sponsorship, experimental business models and stuff like that. And Ted's nice. working on a game right now for Gamma, which is pretty sweet. I've been playing it all weekend. Got the high score uh-huh. at, uh, at 40 grand, and I'm uh, pretty proud of that. Yeah, that was before he changed the rules to make it difficult, so. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, it wasn't. No, yeah, dude. Oh. <laughs> I kicked his ass. All right, well, you know. <laughs> If Ted's in the chat, tell him. <laughs> okay, there he is. Are you guys fully Unity now? Like, is that is oh, that God. a permanent so, shift of gears? 
yeah, we like we switched to Unity for our Gamma game, and at first I was scared as shit to get into it for a competition. But oh my god, it's so good! You guys are completely right. It's I never want to do anything other than Unity. That ever sounds again. pretty script. That's no. awesome. I was yeah, well, I was thinking about it on the drive home. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, it's just oh god, so such a breeze. Testimonial, to Mike Boxleiter, and we've gotten developed. we've gotten so much more done with it. Than yeah. We, Oh, it's so good. It's powerful. It's like just allows me to fuck around endlessly with polished shit that Mike hates. Uh, sure. Bugging him about, you know? So. But it's still like we don't know how we're going to make money doing it. Like Josh has made this great cannon shooter game. It's super casual and it'd be great for portals, but it's just not an option. Like we know how to make money with Flash games. We just make a game and sell it to whoever. But yeah, Unity is still kind of new. Do you feel like it's different? Like, because there's some time. It- is there an obstacle in your mind between selling a Flash game and selling a Unity game? Well, yeah, it's it's up to the, the penetration rate, right? you know. Like, it's it, I mean, Flash World is all in the hands of sponsors, and it sucks, um, and I hate it. But you know, that's the way it is, and um, there's uh, it's a pretty good guarantee that you can make, you know, a month plus uh, money, like on a game that's that's your own IP and you keep the IP and like you can maybe take it further and and all this so um, but it's also you know we haven't really like we did the microtransaction thing for Dino Wars but that kind of didn't go very well but um, hmm. it's just an established kind of um, standard you know for Flash whereas like sites like Congregate and Newgrounds they're not really um, doesn't they don't seem to be jumping on the Unity bandwagon. Kong, I, Kong kind yeah. of supports it right now through their iframe stuff. Like they, they launched that new stuff where you can basically host anything in an iframe. So it's kind of like a Facebook game at that point where you actually host the game on your site and then you launch the game on Congregate with their iframe stuff. Yeah. Oh, cool. <clears throat> and you're paying for bandwidth though, aren't you? Yeah, you are. And I think they, they actually are working towards supporting Unity stuff directly as far as I know, like an actual native... And then, like, a, a, a better splash page if you don't have the plugin installed. Yeah. It'd be nice to see. Yeah, definitely. I mean, anything that could... I just think Unity is such a developer-friendly tool. Um, we just... The other side just needs to kind of... Hopefully, it comes by naturally uh, eventually, you know. But. Well, it's, it's so obviously superior to Flash in every single way. I mean, everyone has a 3D card, or most everyone has a 3D card now, so there's no reason to not have it be the standard. It's just going to take time. Yeah. And it's going to be awesome when it comes around. Well, it's awesome you guys like it. That's cool as hell. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Well, except for the UI. If we could <laughs> port, put Flash inside and like, do like a wrapper for Unity. Yeah, that, that's still a common complaint as far as I know, which is fair. Maybe, uh, maybe that'll happen... Somewhere. So when uh, in and we know this, but you guys are kind of rocking out a gamma entry right now. What's the plan after that? Um. Hi, right, Tommy. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. Welcome hey. back, Tommy. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> hey, Tommy. Hey. Anyway, so go <laughs> ahead, guys. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know really. Like okay. We, We've been, I don't know, it's just, it's hard to have any perspective right now. We've just been consumed with this game. Like, we wake up, work on the game. We've been working on it at the apartment and just for like 12, 14 hours a day and then going to sleep and doing it again. So we have like no frame of reference right now. Yeah, right. I mean, we, we got to finish up Eon and get that out the door. And that's going to be great to have that out because it's, it's an awesome game too. And I can't wait for people to play it. Um, yeah, that's true. And uh, then we might have some contract work coming down our way. Who knows? Pay the bills just for a little while. But yeah, what are you guys doing? <laughs> We're working on a new Minotaur China shop for PS3. Seriously? No, <laughs> just, just sorry. I just, I just spitting stuff out that I thought would be amusing. No, we're rocking the uh, the Raptors Far HD now. Yeah, I know. Just yeah. You know. How's it going? Pretty awesome. I'm I'm into it. Like I'm actually having to kind of tear myself away in the evenings when it's time to go home. So been in the zone. Figured a month in, that's a good sign. Yeah, definitely. My yeah. mouth is full of meat. I'll get back to you on that in like a second. T- 
typical Matthew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> typical. But yeah, it's been cool. Like it's it's it actually hasn't been that nightmarish. Um, you know, now that the team size is, has been reduced, um, we've all kind of, if anything, fallen into our our rut that much better and harder. And and we just, I mean, two years of making games with each other has made relationships better and working so much quicker. So yeah, I mean, it's not yeah. it, it is not the uh, grind so far that I was wondering it might become. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're we're kind of at a tipping point where we're about to start work on new gameplay stuff because to, to date we've been increasing the visual quality of the game and kind of rewriting code and making the physics a little bit more tunable and better. So it'll actually be kind of exciting slash terrifying to get to the point where it's like, oh, well, can we make a race mode that's really fun? And yeah. uh, if the answer is uh, not really, we're gonna have to, oh, uh oh, well, can we make a, a mode like this that's really fun? Like that's the part of the project that's both exciting and also kind of like. That's when you're really putting your 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 neck out there and like, uh oh, is this actually going to work? Yeah, especially when you guys have already put sunk this much work into the project. Yeah, and then like like the first game was pretty well encapsulated, where like the whole experience of playing the game is kind of self evident. Like, oh yeah, you kind of fuck around in this sandbox like world, and now right. we have to figure out when you like pay for the game on Steam or XBLA or PSN or what you know wherever it ends up. Like, how will your tenth hour of Plane be different and more developed and more invested in than like your first hour of playing. Right. Yeah. Like, what will you learn? Sure. Yeah. I mean, like the the more obvious structures I think are like you know an upgrade path of some kind or a level progression difficulty pro- progression of some kind where you feel like you're using all these skills that you've learned in the game. But it's you know what does it actually mean for the design? Like, where does that actually kind of come down on when you, you open up like like a code editor? How do you make that all happen? Right. So. um so is there a handbrake in the game? Uh, <laughs> there is now, yeah, in the new version. Yes. We we basically redid the physics, and then we we've been redoing it with um, an Xbox controller or any controller, not specifically Xbox, but like a, you know, like a dual analog, dual sort of trigger controller in mind. Cool. Does it feel good? Yeah, it's yeah. it's feeling better. Uh, I've been spending probably too much time on the tuning lately, but we made some tools, or I made some tools that make tuning easier. So yeah. we, we have like a custom Unity GUI thing where we can just sort of drag numbers back and forth and then make different tuning sets. So like I'll, I'll have a set of numbers that are just arbitrary numbers, like you know the down force on the car and like the side force at which it starts to slip. And we can make a second set of numbers that are based on any other set of numbers. So I can have like a in the air tuning set for the car, and then I can change just a few numbers. Like when you're in the air, the center of mass goes up and your down force goes down, and like your angular drag turns off and stuff. So we're probably going to release these on the tech block soon because it's actually a really easy way to tune a whole crap ton of numbers together. Yeah. But tuning is kind of a, a dangerous trap where you can tune for like two hours and not even be sure if it feels any better or worse than it did two hours ago. Yeah. Fucking cactus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Hold on. I'm going to mute and cough for a bit. So, uh... Stuff. It's going on in communism land. What's that? What's up? Oh, um. What are you doing? I'm working. I I literally just woke up. Like really? Maybe thirty minutes ago. Isn't it East Coast time out there? Isn't it like nine o'clock? Yeah, yeah, it's nine o'clock. I haven't I haven't slept really since the yesterday. I don't know. It's it's pretty healthy being a game developer, isn't it? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm like jittery right now and smell terrible. It's good. Oh yeah. I, hey, is it bad that I don't remember the last time I've showered? No, <laughs> oh, that's and light. Also, as a follow up, is it bad that I don't smell? When's the last time you actually left your apartment? That's I went a, that's to the store. Well, we have like a foot of snow, and I went to the store like yesterday or the day before. And how did it smell when you walked back into your house? Well, it smells like, uh, like, uh, cause, um, I made like hot nuggets, you know, you know about hot nuggets, right? No. <laughs> okay. So hot nuggets are like, like little chicken nuggets and you bread them and you fry them and you put hot sauce on them. Hot nuggets. Wow. Yeah. But I, I forgot to take the grease out. So my house kind of smells like, like kind of burnt peanut oil. Yeah. <laughs> it's not too bad though. You need to clear that out and then stay in the house for a bit 
and then leave and go back in to really ascertain if you stink like a right. dead person. No, no, no. See, I like, you know, I put my nose in my shirt like this. You know, yeah, but I you're immune to it. Like when you're in Maybe an IGF grind. You're totally I, asked, I asked my dad if I smelled, and he said no. Well, maybe he smells just as bad <laughs> at the same time. No, dad showers like every day. Actually, Tommy, how, how much longer do you have to work on Super Meat Boy? <clears throat> um, a while-ish. Well, it's I mean, like, just sort of like, <laughs> is, is the order of magnitude weeks, months, half of a year? It's it's months because of something coming up. Yeah. yeah okay. The, uh, as an honest question, how 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 well do you think you can ascertain your own sense of burnout? I know a lot of hardcore programmers love to say like, "Oh, I never burn out," but do you have any sense of self monitoring? Like, do you have any idea when and if you'll fall down that path where like, "Oh my God, I'm starting to burn out. I need to take a break." I don't know. See, I've been I've been kind of working the same way for the last like five years, and I don't know. I I think it's just kind of I just kind of melted into it. Like I don't, I don't have problems with my wrists or anything, and I, I type more than anybody I know. I don't have like carpal tunnel things, you know. I, I'm, I don't really get sick. Uh, I just have the one sick. So I, I don't know. I think maybe I'm kind of sort of built for it in a way. Also, to to uh, match that, I haven't touched a woman in five years. So, <laughs> so that that's how it kind of goes. But yeah, as far as like like every once in a while, I'll take a day and you know just not do anything, like barely watch TV, barely do just just kind of like sit and do nothing and just chat with people. I, but every, every once in a while, I'll do that. But other than that, you know, I just I just kind of work. It's 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 kind of the reason I just woke up is because I just kind of work at my own pace. And when we have deadlines. You know, I'm I'm used to I'm used to having like crazy deadlines, so I just I just work through them, and then like the next day I'll sleep for a couple of days. <laughs> so that's about it. Do you feel like there's actually a a net positive there versus if you had not crunched and then slept for three days, where maybe just worked at like a sort of average pace for five days? Do you think that's better? Well, it's not that it's not that I'm like forcing myself to work um, the long hours. It's I just I just work those long hours because. I can't, if I'm in the middle of something, I can't fall asleep. So it's, it's not like I'm sitting there like ridiculously tired. Like when, uh, I think it was like the day before this IGF, I was, or no, it was, it was before the final judging deadline. I was up for like, I don't know how long, but like right up until the end of it, I had been up, I had already been up for well over 24 hours. And then after it was all done, everything was still buzzing so much. I didn't go to bed until like eleven the next day or something. So it was. It just. Yeah. I just can't. I just can't calm down once I'm yeah. once I've started like working on something pretty heavy. Hmm. It's a switch. It's like killing a man. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly like that in my experience. <laughs> You guys actually, Mike and Greg, you you and I think there was a blog post about this at some point in the last six months to a year, whatever. But you guys shortened your business hours too, right? Um, yeah, for uh, briefly, yeah, we did it. Okay. We like we've been doing it. We've been pretty good about it um, until the Gamma game started, and then we both got huge boners for it and just <laughs> right, went crazy. Right. But um, the uh, yeah, I don't know. I think like I I kind of identify with Tommy is saying just because you know I've I was doing that for I don't know three or four years I was in school and I we started our business in my senior year of college so I was doing full-time school and dino wars um yeah and so I just was constantly working and I just carried that through for the next two and a half years and then I just imploded um right yeah yeah after that so like and it was mostly because uh I think um kind of a support structure in school like I had 50 other design students that I was working with and they were all workaholics and we were all working together and had friendships inside the cocoon of work you know yeah so when I was off on my own in the middle of Iowa <clears throat> you know and everyone moved away it was kind of like all I have is work so and it all hit me at one point um so that's a fun story. <laughs> yeah. 
found I can't do all nighters unless I've got people pulling around me who are also not necessarily working with me, but who are also going through the same experience of like, yeah, we're all up really late working on this stuff and just, you know, <clears throat> out and have fun being a part of that is, is huge for me. Like the game jams are awesome for me. I, I love game jams. I, I don't pull all nighters, but when a game jam comes around, I really Bless get into me. it. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I feel old now because I I can't pull all nighters at all. Like, Flashbang is going to be seven in like March or April, and then we were kind of doing our own thing before that too. So I, I don't know. I feel like I, I used to do that kind of stuff. Like, yes, you can graph the subversion commits from our first game, and there's like a huge spike at three and four in the morning, and now <laughs> all of our stuff is like ten to three, ten to four. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's controlled. Like, that's a conscious decision that we made, though, like, to, to make sure that things are happening during those specific hours. So, like, are you completely positive you wouldn't be able to do an overnighter, like, if there's creative energy? No, I, I think I'd be able to do it. I, I just don't know if, like, whenever I even do caffeine, I always feel like I've gained a little bit of productivity and then lost the same amount plus, like, that 3% you're doing a drug tax. So I always feel like, I, you know, you, you kind of exchange concentration and productivity for... I guess less time, like you, you do do a drug, which you know, like caffeine or whatever, which gives you more concentration, more productivity, and then you, you get more done in the same amount of time. But I feel like that exchange always has like that, like like a PayPal esque three percent on the top fee. So if you make those kinds of exchanges all the time, like I'm always doing caffeine, I'm always catching up on sleep. I think that that three percent, five percent overhead just just eats away at you. I think you actually get more done if you treat it more as a marathon. Like you know, this is going to be a year long thing versus a. Like I, I think part of it was the Blurst eight week schedule. Like I, I realized going into Blurst, like if we treated every eight week project as a single solitary eight week project versus the oh eight week project's done and then like eight week plus one day, you're like well time to start up the second eight week project. Right. I think that is much different from like I'm gonna make a game in eight weeks and then sleep for a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Sure. I think I would if if I didn't have like the company kind of forced us to have some sort of unified work hours. I think if I were back going to like a solo freelance or like an online collaborative kind of guy, I would probably start sleeping, like, you know, staying up until three, four or five in the morning. Cause even now it'll be midnight. And I, I've noticed in like the last two or three weeks, especially when GDC is coming up and we're kind of engaging more publishing type folk on Raptor Safari, like every single idle thought of mine is basically Raptor Safari. Like, what yeah. do I have the intern do on Monday? How are we going to start this racing stuff? Oh, what about this? What about if you had a, a, a chunk of meat on the end of your chain? All the rappers would run towards you oh. and not away from you. And like all these ideas, and it's just fun. <laughs> yeah, we actually, need to, we actually need to make that happen. But it's just, I, I can barely carve out enough mental energy for like, oh, I have a girlfriend. Oh, I, I told her I would try to do this. Oh, oh God. Like it's <laughs> conscious effort to push away anything. And not even that, it's conscious effort to be like, oh, yeah, I was, I was going to rejuvenate fun motion. Sometime, like six months ago. Oh shit! Or oh, I wanted to do music production. Or oh, I haven't unicycled in fucking two months. Yeah. <laughs> Unless I make it a habit, like oh, I, I made it a habit to go to you know CrossFit, go to the gym. Unless I've actually made it into a habit, it's so hard <laughs> for me to sort of break that divert mental attention from this thing is consuming me. So yeah, I'm pretty sure if I, I didn't have like the the 10 a.m. start time for Flashbang, I really would be like, oh, I can't sleep because I'm thinking about Raptor Safari. Well, fuck it. You know, I'm just going to get up and go work on it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. T- Tommy has a week. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, but they, like the, the sensible part of me thinks that, oh, it is it is better to, even if I'm not, well, even if I am thinking about it at home, it, it's not like I'm cranking away on code. Like I, to date, I haven't checked in any code that I've done at home. Like all I've ever checked in from home was like a tuning where I'd be playing the game to get ideas and then I'm like, oh I'm gonna fix the, the way that the two wheel is working. Right. I have yet to date since I've been in my new place, so it's been like a year. I have yet to ever work on code from home. Which is both good and bad. I think it's good because I actually can go home and be somewhat away, but even then like I spent today clearing out my email inbox. Sure. About zero. It's it's two right now. Uh oh. <laughs> And what, that word it. one of them is, uh, hey, you know, you want to write this book on Unity? And I'm like, yeah, yeah kind of. But <laughs> if, you, if you look at your time in that zero-sum way, like if I'm going to find time to, to work on Unity, like a Unity book or to like work on FunMotion, like what am I going to reduce? Assuming I, I, I just can't like 
scrunch my eyebrows and be more productive and get more done in like a single solitary day like what am i going to kick out from my day like i guess i could not like browse the web as much but that doesn't eat up a lot of my time i guess i could not have a girlfriend or not go to the gym and like I don't, I, there you go i kind of, I kind of want those <laughs> things like, i think those things are helping me more in the long term than they're going to hurt me or in the short term yeah no that's true so i don't know it's just like I think I, that definitely doing the right thing i mean i am envious of uh, that kind of like lifestyle of you know having balance <laughs> but you know i do i also do love like getting the bug of game development and just like it's just so exciting when yeah, yeah. no i definitely that agree with that yeah, I, yeah i'm actually kind of jealous of like the the sort of the internet rogues like you know alakaloka has kind of gone from like like a, a one time company man of sorts into like this massively awesome independent collaborator where he, he does stuff with everybody. And I'm yeah. actually kind of jealous of that at some point. Like, I would love to wake up and be like, ah, oh, I just finished up this small project. Like, who do I want to work with? Oh, yeah, Edmund wants to make a game with me. Although I'm sure now he's swamped with Meat Boy, but you know, just, just in, in general. And it, it's kind of weird that I've, I've displaced that, oh my God, game development for like a week at a time, not sleeping thing with, in exchange, I have these, oh my God, I got so much done today. And by today, I mean like the last four hours at work. Like, yeah. Instead of this week of an awesome high where none of my friends have seen me because I've been working on some awesome new thing, it's just I, I, I get that same kind of kick, but off of a, oh my god, I got so much done when we got back from lunch, and now it's three thirty, and I feel spent already, which is like this, it's the same thing, but in a microcosm of oh, the last three hours were really freaking great. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know, it sounds like a responsible adult thing to do, and that's not you know. I mean, this is video games we're talking about, right? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Yeah, and I think part of it is just like the natural progression. Like we, my my work patterns were <clears throat> exactly what I think a lot of people that get into it. Not that I'm calling like someone like Tommy sort of a a newcomer, because I think Tommy's a machine that can go on for thousands of years. <laughs> but I think it, like we 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 have been there, and at some point we're like, well, we've seen the pros and cons of both, and we're kind of moving more towards a more structured. And part of it is just our size. I mean, we're we're three people now, but we do have an office and we do try to like synchronize just so we, we do have times at which you know, like I, I, I can't call up Ben at 11 o'clock and be like, Hey Ben, like at night and be like, I, I really need the new model for the, like the Raptor with a flag on it. So I can do like the racing thing. Like it's just, it's not acceptable in our social arrangement, I guess, to do that. Sorry, Mike. Interesting. That's nice. That, that's so neat. <laughs> I mean, there, very few times I will actually, I think once in the last six months, I texted Ben because our graphic designer, Michael Heald, is based in the UK. And I texted Ben like, oh, hey, can you get me something? Because he wants to work on this tomorrow for his day. And his, you know, his tomorrow is like our midnight. And I was fucking furious. Yeah, but like that, that's the only time I can even think of work. I'm actually paying. <gasps> I mean, we, we inevitably talk about work. Like if we go out to eat on the weekend, like the company pays for an Indian dinner like every week or every other week. And we inevitably will shoot the shit about, oh, hey, what are we doing for the Unity, GDC, something or other? But it's never like a pull out your pen and paper. It's time to brainstorm how we're going to handle like waypoint setup or whatever the hell. Yeah, right. I think it's pretty well contained. It's obviously not as well contained as I think my girlfriend or maybe other people in our individual lives would like, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I'm it actually... is. It's like game development for some reason. Um... We can, we beat ourselves up, you know. I think it's just artists in general. You're super passionate about what you're doing, and you're creating something that you really want to see happen, and you're just going to think about it and talk about it a lot. It's just natural. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it's more the like the act of creation. For for me, what it is is I, I'm actually not as interested in game development as I think some of my peers. Like to compare myself to like Steve Swink, Steve lives and breathes games and new game ideas. I, I think games are interesting, but they're they're not my life in the way that some other people in the indie world I know. Wait, that, the grammar broke down there. But my point is, <laughs> I'm compelled to create, though. Like, I care so much more about creation than I do about what exactly it is that I'm creating. And I think it's just people that are compelled to create, whether it is art yeah. or music or, you know, poetry or whatever, are kind of the same, yeah, I don't know. In no, it's definitely it's true. Yeah, I actually had an epiphany about that. Uh, while we were working wow, on our Gamma heavy. game, where I was like, I realized that our Gamma game isn't exactly the type of game that I want to play necessarily all the time. Like, it's a cool game, but it's not like the games that I grew up with, like Deus Ex or whatever. Like, I want to make all these different games. But when it comes to, like, what I want to create, it's exactly what I want to be creating. Like, it's some kind of 
huh. weird secondary thing. Like I, it's not, I don't dream about playing it, but I dream about creating it exactly the way I want to create it. Huh. You know, it it's like a secondary yeah. drive. Yeah. We, a lot of us have talked about how it's, it's more fun to make a game than it is to play a game. Like, I think a lot of us get more satisfaction out of just making something now than we do out of actually playing something, even something that we have made or something that our friends have made. Yeah. I find that kind of fascinating. Because whenever I tell somebody I'm a game developer, a lot of people are like, oh, you must play games all the time. And I, I'm like, uh, and I try to think back. I'm like, what's the, the longest game that I played that wasn't like someone pasted me a Flash game link and I played it for like two minutes? And I'm like, uh, I, I guess I played like Bioshock. And then I think back, I'm like, that was a while ago. Like, that doesn't <laughs> count. Yeah, yeah it's, it's more like the fun challenge of making something. Yeah, I think it is a lot in the challenge, and just kind of that, the alchemy that goes into it, and uh, you know, just seeing it happen, like seeing this world come to life out of thin air. Really, it's awesome. Yeah, I've actually had a lot of fun making. Like we we made some some training games for for Cisco Systems, which is you know that Fortune 100 networking company. <laughs> huh. No, I'm just fucking with you, man. Oh, I actually, didn't, I actually didn't hear it. It was like a distortion. Oh, he said, that's Andy. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you think pays for the company? Um, <laughs> but when, when he first got the project, we we were pitching it to them as like a Flash game. And at the time, we had never touched Flash. Like, at the this was three years ago, so the company was literally me and Steve. And we, we were like, all right, let's do this. And then we got the gig, and I drove down to a bookstore, and I bought a bunch of books on Flash and got like the Colin Mook book on action script two or whatever and sat down and like read it like a crazy person on my floor and where you're, you're on the floor with a book kind of in front of you and you're like your your hand is really propped up on your chin and i just stared at it for like you know two days in a row and that was a really fun project <clears throat> I did get to conquer the challenge of learning something yeah and then now we've done like 10 total projects for cisco and like i can tell you the 10th one was not nearly as fun for me as the first one yeah well, like we talk, we talk a lot about that uh, with the Gamma game. Just, I mean, get games. The fun of games is usually learning, um, and learning the new mechanics, and then using them and ex- like becoming an expert. So, you know, we had to do a lot of teaching of the player for our Gamma game because, you know, we don't know how to teach the player because we know how the game works. Um, and so, it's very much the same kind of experience, uh, like education versus. Yeah, it's like games, the best games distill down that education loop of learning something new and then applying it. Because that's, that's what fun, that's a big part of what fun is. I mean, I'm not going to say that I know what fun is, but yeah. like yeah. learning something and I using it. I want to know what fun is. Know what fun is. <laughs> you know, I, I totally agree with you on that. Whenever I enjoy a game, especially like a physics-ish game, I really enjoy the fact that I'm doing all these sort of complex maneuvers. And even when I'm thinking about how the Raptor Safari experience is going to be like 10 hours in, I kind of imagine this player who is doing like a really complicated thing where they, they do like a jump and then deploy their chain and then swing over and connect, like connect the Raptor and then open up one of their doors on the fly to like hit the other Raptor as they drive by. Like, you know, all these complicated maneuvers that we're going to have to teach one at a time. But the ultimate experience is going to be this sort of self-expression. Kind of like if you watch a, like a Tony Hawk player who knows the fuck out of Tony Hawk, they play it and they're just kind of like, oh, I'm just going to jump on this wall and wall ride it and jump off and do a couple kick flips and then land and do this and grind. But the, the actual learning of that experience was very, very painful and very, very drawn out. Yeah. So you're I'm curious about that. Uh, go ahead, Tommy. It's all you. Uh, I, was just, I was just confirming door checking in Velociraptor. Yeah, I mean, if if you're going to have those LB and RB buttons that just kind of sit there above the triggers, <laughs> you might as well, well, not specifically doors, but they could default to your doors, and then maybe you could bolt on a weapon to your left or right side, and those would fire your left or right weapons. I like that. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we have all these ideas, and like the problem right now is that they're, they're basically <clears throat> ideas, and not even ideas we talked about as a company, they're just things that we're trying to push forward slowly. Like right now, it's like we're, we're, we're going to focus on racing for the next two weeks. Like, is it fun for us to say as developers, what you have to do, the player, is like drive to this waypoint and then that waypoint, or maybe the waypoints are wrappers that have huge flags in them that you have to kill or whatever. But it's like, is that going to be fun as the player, or is it going to be, there's a waypoint up here right across this land bridge, and you fall off the land bridge, and you have to like, oh, fuck. Do I have to drive back up? Can I respawn? Like, we're, we're going to get to these ideas farther down the road by doing the barest minimum. Like, we need to have this in the game somehow. Because I don't know about you guys, but I have a really hard time imagining successfully what an idea will actually be like as a player. Like, the idea is, oh, you're like a ragdoll and you're, you're, you're thrashing things in the china shop. 
And it's really hard to imagine, is that going to be boring or is that going to be surprisingly compelling? And then you yeah, actually have to get like, it playable in some rough, rough form. I know exactly how, how it's going to work. So it usually <laughs> works fine. I'm not even <laughs> where I, I think about what a player would do until oh, somebody's actually playing the game. And then we find out, oh, shit, we should have had a continue screen in there because it's retarded. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's all about just that. Like, and that's why Unity and like those quick prototyping tools are so essential. Just because you can just try shit out. And yeah, out. I've I've always been surprised at how like when we did Crane Wars, we had this prototype where you could you know stack things and move them around, but we had no timer, no score, no 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 penalties. And I, I always try to imagine is if the game were keeping track of what I were doing. So I'm like I'm, I'm trying to keep track of myself, kind of honor system. Okay, I've stacked four things pretty quickly. That should be worth some more points. But I found that until that actual like rigid game structure is in place where the game is telling you, okay, that was worth more points, okay, that you totally fucked up there, it's really hard for me to tell how that pressure will actually yeah. convey into fun. Like It's just so hard to predict it. Yeah, I mean, like at the Game Jam this weekend, um, a lot of games will have, you know, they'll have the framework and the controls and the environment in there. And but game rules are always last. It seems you know everyone waits for player death to be you know the last thing, and uh, it just like completely changes how you feel about the second to second gameplay. You know it's like you care about it or you don't or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's it's one of the things that I really want to push for when we go forward. It's because I wish I to imagine. Okay, yeah, like the racing example in, in, in Raptor Safari. It's like oh, okay, so I can imagine. There's a waypoint, and I can kind of see it on the mini-map, and I have to drive to it. But I have no idea if that's going to feel satisfying when I get there, like, oh, I did what I was supposed to do, or that really, like, don't tell me where to drive kind of rebellion thing. I have just no idea how I'll even react to it until it's actually, like, even in super rough, really ugly, playable form. Dude, the rap should have, like, a white T-shirt with, like, cigarettes rolled up on the... (laughs) (laughs) I really want to have a... Um, like a a raptor female with a headset that kind of her 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 head pops up and like a world like Warcraft like character style overlay where it's like oh it's a little talking head has popped up to tell me to do something and it's like a yeah. really sexy raptor from the future <laughs> headset. and like you the, you like the driver raptor have kind of fallen in love for her I'm into that <laughs> yeah. that sounds hot it's like that yeah. uh, dragon porn that, uh, dragon illustra- porn? illustrated dragon porn with the cars uh, oh, oh shit. shit yeah oh. I've seen that. <laughs> That's well, send me a link to this. <laughs> we actually had something funny happen, like in the last couple of weeks of the original Raptor Safari. We found a an incoming link was coming from a, a furry forum, <laughs> except there was a like a specific thread within this forum that was for scalies, like people who <laughs> like lizards and dinosaurs and shit like that. Well, someone was making a big deal about Raptor Safari because they're like, oh, they're the dinosaurs are so pretty. They're so colorful, and they've got. So I think Adam, you know, he was still with us at the time. Yeah, I actually, actually told him to do it. Yeah, he he put the the raptor model in like this seductive laying down, come do me pose, and we posted it in the thread, and they loved it. But, like the funny thing is, none of them figured out. They, I think, someone said like, "Hey, where'd you find that?" But no one figured out that the only people that could produce that would be the developers, and yeah, they must be aware of it. They're just like, "Oh, that's a pretty good find." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hacked them or something. Yeah, I guess you, people probably yeah. aren't in a in a questions asked kind of mood in those forums. It's just like yeah. you don't yeah. ask where anything comes from. Yeah, it's slash fiction to be about your game, but that's that's trouble moving in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you have any kind of characters, people will do it anyway. Have any of uh, you intuition guys or even Tommy seen a uh, Visioneers? Mm. It's a weird indie movie with Zach Galifianakis. I always add syllables to his name. Okay. Anyway, I was. I'm thinking you about, it. yeah, you, you should watch. But I was actually thinking about kind of a, a weird, and this is really, really weird corporate overlord vibe. And I was kind of wanting to push for something weird like that for Safari when it comes to taking directions from your your corporate masters. Like, why are you doing the things that you're doing? Yeah, it was really, really creepy and awkward. You guys got to see this flick. Like, it's it's just so no, you know, it's, love, it's eerie. I love the Yeah, yeah. I, I never know how to say his name. I think it's just Galifianakis. Yeah, I think it's I think it's simpler than I make it out to be. Between two friends. Yeah. Yeah, what's yeah, yeah. he call him? What? What does he call the guy? It's like Oh, get put the fern back? Yeah, put the fern back. That's right. <laughs> you guys watch Tim and Eric? All right, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So I'll, I'll paste something there. Anyway, yeah, I just I was trying to push for it because I don't think many games have achieved really weird vibes. 
in the way that movies like this achieve really weird vibes. Agreed. I think games can achieve a lot of confusion or a lot of like, oh, that's really pretty looking. But I don't yeah. think many games are like, this makes me feel really weird about myself and my purpose in life. Mm-hmm. That's what you're going for? I, well, I mean, when we think about how you, you're going to take mission structures from... Because like the, the general gist of the game that we don't... Well, we, we haven't communicated this much to the players, but to my surprise, people... Seems like it, it seems like people are desperate for backstory because every site that's talked in depth about Raptor Safari or China Shop has picked up on our stupid backstories, which is that you work for some sort of future corporation who is killing prehistoric raptors and then teleporting them to the future to make taco meat. And like it, it's it's a stupid contrived story, but it shows up in a lot of places surprisingly that people kind of figure it out. Or like in China Shop, we had a you you were a minotaur fresh from the labyrinth and, you know, thanks to groups sy- sympathetic to your cause of having this sort of min- minotaur rage, you had been freed early and then you were trying to get your china shop off the ground, but you had this crippling condition of minotaur rage. And we, we barely communicated to the player, but like every review that's talked in depth about what, what, what the game actually means has mentioned it. So I think people are actually kind of looking for more of a backstory, so we should probably try to give them one. Not like a huge backstory, but like a, yeah. a more thought out context, even if we don't have a lot of surface area contact with the player. Like we, I think a lot of games have backstory, and then they just try to increase the surface area where that backstory touches the player by <clears> like a, a five-minute, yeah, like a hugely long c- cinematic intro. I think it's enough to, to have your backstory gelled on your side of the fence, like as a developer, and then keep your surface area still quite minimal where you only rarely reference it. But I think as long as you reference it consistently, and uh, people will actually figure it out. Yeah. I'm worried that if we add too much, then... The, the absence of mystery will make it less compelling because, like, there's just so many weird conclusions you could draw from yeah, no, the ambiguity I, in the first one. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't want it to be overly um, thematic, I guess. I just want it yeah. to be at least consistent from our end where we could answer as developers if the corporation is evil or if they're right. hiding the truth from the public or if the public loves them or not. Even if we don't ever tell the player that, I think it actually kind of leaks through. Mm-hmm. But it'd be, you know, it sounds like you, you're trying to kind of put the story in a framework where you can use it as motive for the player, you know, like direct motive. Yeah, I, I, I actually think Visioneers does a pretty good job because you, you wonder, like, how the fuck these people even live. And I, I, I kind of want the player to, to wonder why it is they're doing what they're doing, even if we never tell them. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I, I actually probably just paste it in Skype. The opening scene. Although you guys might not be able to watch it there on the Skypes. But anyway, hey, Michael, Greg, I'm curious about your guys's um, living conditions. Actually, uh, I was wondering if you guys live with people or not, and how that affects your creativity and motivation. It's horrible. Yeah, it's it's got There's, really bad. There are mice on the floor for so everywhere. Trash. Well, <laughs> <laughs> like, so, that, uh, so you guys live alone, and it's dirty, is what I'm understanding. <laughs> no. Um, so I had uh, I was living with a friend of mine, and then I moved out like a month ago, and on short notice, the only place I could really move in was with Mike. So I live with Mike now. And oh, okay. Kind of sucks. Um, so I mean, it's not ideal, but it's cheap as fuck, and I don't know. We're working it out. You know, it's like we already see each other enough during the day, so we don't want to see each other at night and all that have our own lives but um. yeah I think that's mostly why I was curious like I, I noticed there was a difference in the way I, I think that we all kind of saw each other flashbang like once we were forced to get out of the studio at a certain time and like go do our own thing and yeah. and also just like for me and even for for Matthew and Tommy I think too like like going and living in the in the way we should be either with people or without like has this huge effect on creativity and it's just really strange yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. I mean, we're actually um, we're doing a lot of like branching out, and I think it's almost been for the better because I don't know. It's in the middle of fe- like February's hitting, and it's Iowa, and it sucks, and we hibernate. So it's like it's kind of forcing us to find people to co-work with in Ames, and um, you know, like we have VRAC here, which is uh, the virtual reality application center um 
it's kind of has a bunch of nerds that do game game like stuff. Oh, okay. And so we go oh. there sometimes, and so it's been like living together. We're trying to kind of branch out more and work together a little less, I suppose. Yeah. You know, if we're working on the same thing, and it's been pretty, it's been pretty good so far, I think. Yeah. That's kind of how Tegvent started as well. It's just kind of like we need to talk to other people more often and. Right. Stuff. Yeah, I didn't even think about the winter factor. Like living in Arizona, you know, that just doesn't really occur to me. Like <laughs> where there's these couple months where you can't really go outside and enjoy yourself. Oh yeah, dude, it sucks. Yeah, yeah it was. Brutal. It was like seventy-two today or something like that. Stop. Great. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Come to Tempe, boys. Mike, yeah. I mean, he still goes out and runs. He's kind of crazy. Yeah. Well, oh, shit. I saw that photo you posted, actually, where your like, face is covered in ancient frozen yeah. ice. He's trying to get a date, you know? So. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good face for you right there. <laughs> I don't know. Awesome. It's not running. like that, Especially that day specifically, running is kind of my outlet for if I had a really rough day or a really... Um, stressful thing. I just need to get out and go run, and I come back and I just feel awesome from that. So that kind of gets me out of there. And Greg doesn't do it, so it's kind of a yeah separating thing. Yeah, I hate running. He just hates moving in general. He just <laughs> it hurts. I hate running. Running feels like death. <laughs> I like yeah. basketball. I like other exercise, but running just sucks. Yeah, I don't know. I hated the hell out of it up until just a few months ago. I actually started enjoying it, and now it's awesome. Like, I just love doing it. It's weird. It's just a complete reversal. Wow. I wish I loved running. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I loved running. <laughs> it's just like you can do it anytime. Like, for me to play basketball, I've got to, well, especially in the winter, it just basically doesn't happen. Yeah. That's tough to get. We've got a court in our and parking lot at our office. Um, so I go out there in the summers and spring and everything. But so I actually have a, a question that's kind of uh, rhetorical, but not question. Like, if you had a game that hit pretty big and you got like a million dollars or whatever in your bank account, what kind of living slash working slash city you lived in arrangement would you push for? Like, would you move to San Francisco and yes. get a pretty sweet plaid? Like. Have you thought about it? Because we're actually thinking. Well, I'll, actually, I'll let, you, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you answer first. Yeah, we think about that every day. That's our goal. Move to San Francisco. Cool. Mm. Get the fuck out. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we just need something new. Really, We've been in Iowa our whole lives, and just want to try something else. I guess. I mean, like we live in Ames, Iowa. I don't know if you've done your research or whatever, but um, <laughs> I mean, we 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 love our friends who live yeah. here. And who are listening. Marisol. <laughs> no, but, I mean, it's just like, it's a university town, but it's also kind of conservative, and um, we're kind of yahoos, so, we like, and there's just kind of like a cultural gap, I think, yeah. um, that we're missing, and, uh, yeah, I just feel like I have, we have a lot more in common with um, people in San Francisco, but, you know, I'm kind of naive, you know, I'm just like this boy on a farm. Grew up on a farm, you know. You didn't grow up on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's the grass is always greener. It might just it might suck as just as much, but I find it hard to believe. Yeah, I, I think it would suck less. And I'm um, I'm actually from Minnesota myself. And then two of our guys, the the, the Meckley brothers, were from Kansas. So I mean, it, yeah, we're we are pretty well in tune with people trying to get out. And we're we're actually thinking of moving the company not this year, but after Safari ships to to San Francisco or. Bay Area, yeah, but probably actually in the city would be nice. Yeah, dude. I mean, it's just we look on Craigslist probably every other day and um, just look at the prices of the apartments and and get really sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like two two thousand dollars for the yeah. a tiny tiny pad. I uh, I mean, we pay. Well, I pay like two hundred twenty five for rent. Yeah, our rent's five hundred bucks a month for a two bedroom. Yeah. 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 Sounds about here too. Yeah, oh, I mean, really? I've I've got like a, a two bed that I keep all to myself, and I have like a an, an office room that I'm in right now that is just gigantic and covered with computer shit. And then I have you know, like a living area, and it's nine nine hundred bucks a month, but it's that's kind of on the higher end of what you would get for like a, a solo person out here. And so, you know, like Mike and I talk about this, and I kind of talk at Mike about it. Um, 
it's like I think that some of it's your attitude. You know, we we've started like a little list in Iowa. Um, it's called the Iowa Game Development Friendship Club. It's uh, <laughs> focused on friendship and game development and the merge of those two things. And high fives, because you know. <clears throat> and yes. uh, so we uh, and, and like that's been growing consistently. And it's just you know you have hobbyists, you have professionals. Um, coming in and, and like we had like 25 people at the game jam this weekend and it was fucking awesome yeah it was so nice. cool and everyone in there is super talented and smart and I think that if you can find that in Iowa you know I think you can find it in, in just about any state it's what you put into it it's what you'll get out um, if you want to reach out of course you know a game jam it's hard to wrestle people up for a game jam more than once every few months yeah Um, but you know, it'd be nice if it happened like once a month or, or got together once a month. But um, I, yeah, I mean, there's things out there that you can do to organize. And yeah, you guys are it. always welcome in Phoenix too. We're trying to get Tommy to move out here to Phoenix. Yeah, fucking hot. In, in the summer. Yeah, in the in the summer, which lasts from like May until December. It's it's <laughs> it's May until October. Let's be honest here. <laughs> The same it's, problem I would have with uh, the bald head. I just yeah. get like skin cancer after five days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm with you. No, yeah, I yeah. I see Dan's pictures of running up on the mountains and hiking <laughs> every weekend or whatever. And it's like I'm a Boy Scout, you know. I never got to go out to. You the, can't compare it to Dan. I know I can't compare it to Dan, but that's just like, <laughs> oh man, that would be so fucking cool to just run up into the mountains. Okay, I'm in the mountain now. Like ten minutes later. <laughs> yeah, you really can just go in any direction for like a half hour and be in a mountain or in a desert or in a river. Yeah, well, which you know is, has its merits. You're you're probably seeing Dan's Camelback photos, which are literally yeah. like two miles from his house. Wow, that's it's awesome! A, it's in the middle of the city. If you look up Camelback Mountain, yeah. yeah, I mean, I actually we've been putting some deliberate pressure on people to like move to Phoenix because it's Phoenix is not San Francisco in terms of cost, but at the same time, if People are going to be living somewhere that's cheap and not necessarily a social center of the world. Like we might as well all be living in the same cheap and not the social center of the world because then we at least have some kind of collective going yeah. on. Totally. Yeah. I like it here. Yeah, well, you're you're born and raised. You don't you don't yeah, have to I love, I fucking love it, boss. Everybody else wants to get out. I mean I, I'm only here because of an, an ex girlfriend that got me here and then I convinced all my friends to come out and start this company here. And then, you know, all my friends end up getting their own girlfriends who have their own jobs and their own friends. And, like, you know, the roots go out. And then at that point, it's kind of hard to just up and move. So which is – are you talking about San Francisco? Or, I mean, where are your targets set here? Oh, no. Or, I, 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 yeah. I, would lo- I would love to get people to move to Phoenix because I, I don't think we're going to end up in San Francisco until maybe, like, mid to late 2011. And Before the end of the world. Cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right before the end of the world. Uh, but I, I don't know. I saw I, that movie yesterday, by the way. Oh, I did too. It's fucking terrible. It's <laughs> so cringeworthy. Oh, my God. It's like they don't even know how to like tell a story. They're just like, oh, I'm going to kill this guy. <laughs> yeah. You don't have emotional attachment to him because you don't care. Fun, yeah. fun fact, that movie used bullet physics, the bullet physics engine thing. Really? Yep. Uh, no, but I, I, I think the excuse, I mean, like Tommy's given me the excuse of, you know, I, I want to finish this or finish that. I think that's kind of bullshit. I think you should just, if you're, you should just, I have a lease. You, you should just break it. You should just stop and move. Oh yeah. Break it. Yeah. Oh, let me just, let me just fork out my, my hundreds of dollars that I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, actually surprisingly for Arizona, because it's kind of like a re- Republican state, but it's actually very tenant friendly. It's pretty e- easy to break leases out here compared to other states. You basically have to point to like this sprinkler's broken, fix it, and they're like, "What the fuck, sprinklers? Fucking winter!" And then a week later, you can break your lease. If they don't, if they actually don't like remedy problems. But anyway, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm totally serious that I think people should consider living all in one place. But I also say that as the person who's saying, "Come to me," right. and not like me come to you, which I do realize is a lot easier to say than like, "Oh, okay, I'll, let me just get a U-Haul. I'll be, I'll, I'll be right there." I also think Greg was wondering though when we, if we do ultimately decide to move, what are the targets like? Oh no, yeah, I, no, yeah. Um, I'm talking about settling down here, you know. <laughs> yeah, I I think San Francisco is where I'd like to be for most of my 30s. Um, for me, it's either like it, it's an American city, it's basically San Francisco because of just the the people that are already there. 
Like when when I was in San Francisco for the Unity conference, we we stopped by Ron Carmel's house on like the last day or the last two days, and actually stayed there. But when I went over to Ron Carmel's house, he's like, "Oh yeah, I mean, I, I've got Colin Northley over here right now. We're, we're working on a game idea. Come on by." And I, I went over there, and it was like you know two eight year olds that were having like a play date. Like Colin was at <laughs> Ron's table with his laptop, jamming on a game idea. And they just do that shit there because they both live in San Francisco. And I'm like, oh. Yeah. So if I lived here, I could be like, hey, Ron, can I come over and jam out some ideas? And you'd be like, oh, sure, dude. Or Derek or you know, any number of other people. David Hellman. Oh, my God, yes. Um, <laughs> I hope he's not listening. That'd be awkward. No, but it's just the, yeah, like the notion of, of where you should be be as an indie game developer with a little bit of resources because, yeah, the city is fucking expensive. Right. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's either San Francisco or go big and just go live on a beach in Thailand. Like, if you're going to live in even Phoenix or Iowa, in my mind, you might as well be on, like, a cheap-ass beach where you're going to be paying less per month and drinking beer and getting all the, I guess, Thai whores that you want. Um, yeah, all of them. <laughs> all two of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it'd be really fun to live in a foreign city like Kuala Lumpur. Tokyo would be awesome. Uh, but... In the, in, the, in, the, in, the, yeah, in the short term, in like three or four years, I think it'd be fun to move to San Francisco and then stay there for like five years. It's weird when you actually start planning out like, oh, I, I'm, I'm 29 right now. So it's like, oh, time to plan out my, my 30s. It's like, wow. Wow, that's an old thing to say. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but yeah, Tokyo, uh, from the chat, New Zealand would be pretty awesome too. Um, Sean, I think Sean's super into New Zealand. Yeah, no, I... I, I the, the unicycling, the international unicycling, whatever it's called, convention thing was held there recently, and there's photos of people doing like helicopter mountain unicycling, and just the photos of people taking these helicopter trips up to the mountains of New Zealand are so fucking amazing. Like, Jeez, that's where these people live. It's so crazy beautiful. Nerd. My personal goal before like becoming a game developer was live in New Zealand and be a fisherman. Hell yeah, that'd be awesome. That's like my life goal. That'd, that'd be so cool. badass. You could totally do it. You fish? Yeah. Uh, I used to, but I mean, in Arizona, it's like there's only so many places you can go and do that. That's what I love about the notion of being like a, a reasonably intelligent person is that if any one of us were to sit down and think and make notes for eight hours a day on how can I go live in New Zealand as a fisherman, it wouldn't be a matter of if, it'd be a matter of like, is it going to be four weeks or like, you know, three months? Because yeah. you, you would totally end up doing that. Mm -hmm. Like eight hours a day of wanting and thinking and planning will get you pretty much anything. Yeah. As long as you have any modicum of intelligence. Yeah, if you're not a zombie. Yeah, if you're not like, a oh, eight hours a day, I, I watched, you know, the Project Runway marathon. <laughs> Does that count? I shouldn't say that. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm you actually, shouldn't say Project I've Runway. actually seen all, all six seasons of American Project Runway <laughs> and Nerd. Canada and Project Runway Australia. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> so yeah, I'm going to stop so talking so about that as example. <laughs> lay it out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're kind of running low on time, so do you guys have any yeah. last, last minute um, questions, concerns, or from the chat folk, which I think are... Yeah. Sure. We actually seem to have fewer people, but it looks like we have 44 c current viewers, which is about what we had last week, I think. Sure. Although I think, um, uh, for whatever reason, I couldn't get the chat to work for guests, so, which is why all the guests that are trying to talk have not talked, which is why the chat has been more quiet. Yeah. Oh, got it. The, yeah, I, was, I was wondering. The, yeah, the channel modes, it looks like, it, oh, there it is. Maybe now it's actually not moderated. Well, guests, you should be able to speak, maybe. <clears throat> yeah, and then the ch chat had an IRC net split, which is like, god damn it, my my childhood. Welcome. Yeah. Well, yeah. One one thing I'm curious about for um, oh, the guests can speak. Yes. Uh, is if if anybody who like who's gonna do the actual deep dive on all the global game jam entries because there's gonna be a bazillion of them. Jeez, like someone needs to point me to the one percent that are actually cool. Right. Oh, there's so many, and there's so many just like terrible things. Well, they're special, and each one is special, like a snowflake, an individual. <laughs> Your health care levels crazy. All of us are, oh. except for Steve. Yeah, um, Steve. But if you pay for individual health care, it's about a hundred bucks a month. 
But yeah. I, that's actually our hour, so I'm going to cancel the recording, and then we can just go to drunk Skype. For people that are listening on the archives, we do have a follow-up hour where we basically get more drunk and talk more freely. So um, if you're listening archived and you're like in Europe or whatever, just stay up late, you pussy. Yeah, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> oh, man, I'm tactful tonight. And on that <laughs> note, um, special <laughs> thanks to our guests, Greg Woland and Mike Boxlighter. Is, is that close? Yeah, enough? that's it, Boxlighter. Okay. Correct. Nice. Sweet. Tig Radio is put on by Matthew Wagner, Ben Reese, and Tommy Refinis. Tig Radio song by Danny Baranowski. That's Tig Danny. Radio website by Kyle Pulver. Kyle. Tig Radio is proudly sponsored by absolutely nobody, and see you guys next week.